Justice Hart, a special today, our first international guest as Australia reconnects with the world after COVID. Dr. Michael Yusuf is with us, a flying visit for him from Atlanta, Georgia this week to Sydney. He's the senior pastor of Church of the Apostles in Atlanta. He's been in that role since he founded that church in 1987. Michael is the author of more than 50 books and has been a significant prophetic voice, a prophetic Christian voice in the United States and across the world via the Leading the Way ministry. Michael, I just called you an overseas guest, but that's not really right. You've no. been back and <laughs> forward between Atlanta and Sydney once or twice a year for 40 years. Yes, but before that, I became an Australian citizen in 1970. Mm -hmm. So I uh, consider this to be home away from home. Yeah. Now tell us, take us a few years earlier yes. and coming from Egypt and arriving in Sydney, knowing no one, but yes. with a letter introducing you to one man. That's right. And that is uh, Donald Robinson, uh, W.P. Robinson. He was uh, an, an the ma most amazing hand of God directing in a way that as I look back now, 53 years later, uh, I am overwhelmed at the graciousness of God of how that worked. And, you know, I leave Egypt literally escaping in the 60s. I escaped from Egypt uh, under the leadership of Mr. Nasser, who was, mm -hmm. you know, constantly in a state of war with Israel and nationalizing businesses. And, and uh, we, you know, suffered a little bit in our family as a result of those nationalizations. And I was the youngest of a large family. So I kind of literally... As soon as I turned 18, I was going around. Now, you mentioned Donald Robinson. Yes. Uh, and a lot of people with us will know who he is. But of course. for some who don't, yeah. why don't you tell the story of okay. who he was? And of course, he was uh, the vice principal of Moore College when I came here in the 60s, late 60s. And uh, I remember I arrived in, in, in Sydney on a Sunday afternoon. And on Monday morning, I was knocking on his door with that letter of introduction. And that letter of introduction from a, a man who knew my family in Egypt, but living in Beirut, named Aubrey Whitehouse. Mm -hmm. He's from Melbourne. And uh, he worked on the, in the building of the Harbour Bridge. Really? <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, when you go to Australia and you go through the Harbour Bridge, just think, think of me. me. Yeah. <laughs> but Donald uh, Robinson... Uh, later to become Archbishop of Sydney, yes. at that point, principal of the Theological College, yes. he took you under his wing as a he, young under, undergraduate Theological College student. Uh, well, I was before that as an immigrant coming right. in yeah. with, literally, I couldn't put two sentences together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was literally uh, learning. Uh, and he said, well, he said, you need to get a job and, of course, earn, earn some money, save some money. And I said, yes, sir. And uh, he got picked up the phone. He said, where are you staying? I said, well, there's a, a distant family member uh, the, to whom they, my brother wrote a letter and said, would you meet him at the airport? Mm -hmm. uh, he's an Egyptian engineer. So he picked me up at the airport. So I was staying with him for th I stayed three nights. And um, he said, Kings Grove. He said, good. On the way back, on the, get off the train, go to St. Thomas's Kings Grove. And Ken Churchwood, right. he picks up the phone, calls Ken Churchwood, director at the time. And uh, on the way back, I went in and Ken Churchwood found out where I was I, I really haven't finished my first year in college mm. in communication. And he said, when I was a summer, more college summer year at the time, I worked for the PMG, mm -hmm. and I know exactly where you'll fit in. He said, tomorrow morning, Tuesday, I'll pick you up, take you down to that employment office. Mm -hmm. And so Tuesday, I mean, look, I came Sunday. Monday, I met Archbishop Robinson. Yeah. Tuesday, I met, uh, picked up by Ken Churchwood. We went to the city. I got the job on on Wednesday. I was working for the North Sydney Telephone Exchange. <laughs> right. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because the graciousness of Don and Murray Robinson. Right. Yeah. But then there was a journey to become a theological college student. Exactly. Well, I needed to work, learn the culture, learn the language and and really get myself established. And uh, so I worked for the PMG for almost two years. And uh, then I started more college throughout those two years that I don't know how guardianship, uh, uh, mentorship uh, is something that I cannot really even describe where Bishop Don and Mari Robinson have been to me uh, as parents. And in fact, acted as my parents at our wedding. Really? And uh, we have the wedding pictures with the, them standing next to me. And 
my wife Elizabeth and her parents. And so it's been a, a, a really an amazing, amazing experience for me. And as I reflect now at my old age of, of all of that, uh, I'm still, I still get overwhelmed of how that was. Uh, and the first thing he said to me when I got to his study, he said, you know, my father always wanted to be a missionary to Egypt. And that's where the friendship with mm -hmm. Aubrey Whitehouse, who was in Egypt, came from. He said, but now, that's never happened, but now Egypt came to us. Yeah. And uh, that was just a, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, experience that I look back to with a fondness and gratitude. I don't think I've ever came to, us, to Sydney to visit whether it was through ministries that I was conducting back then or later on, without going over. To see. To see Don Donald. and Mary Robinson, and many times we'll go out to have a meal together. And, um, and I said, I'm going to do this uh, until, you know, one of us go home. <laughs> and we did. Yeah. And uh, it's just uh, such a fondness that I have uh, of that couple, that uh, gratitude that it cannot be described in yeah. words, really. You have talked about not just his personal care for you, yes. but the impact that he's had on oh, you theologically. Yes. I came from a mixed up background, really theologically. You know, evangelical home in Egypt, uh, grandfather on my mother's side was one of the great lay leaders within the Brethren movement, the Plymouth Brethren <laughs> movement. Uh, he actually, at his own expense, built the very first assembly in Egypt. And then, you know, Wesleyan and Presbyterian, and I was kind of a confused boy mm -hmm. when it came to theology. So sitting at the feet of Don Robinson on that first year more college and learning biblical theology, it left an indelible mark on me to this day that I'll be preparing a message and I'm thinking literally his, he, he is in my, mm. in my hearing and in, in, and in my mind of his teaching about the, the unity of the scripture and uh, the, the Old and the New Testament and, and this kingdom of God and the whole, uh, th that, that's just been a f a truly formative for me. I loved all the others and I told them so recently. Uh, they taught me, every one of them taught me something that I have never forgotten, but Don's impact on my life was, was just unmatched. Mm. And uh, I am so grateful for that. Um, and I, I just truly cannot express in words what, what his teaching meant to me mm. personally. And, and you know, I've, I'm standing uh, in a culture, an evangelical culture now, after, since we left the Episcopal Church, that is now falling apart. Mm. And I look back and I said, because of that, because of those years. Biblical theology. Because of biblical theology. And because of the respect for the authoritative word of God, that I'm able to stand and write and speak b boldly and bluntly against this departure from the faith mm. once delivered that is now rampant among evangelicals in America. Mm. I mean, I don't want to give wrong impression, but that just really is a problem. Yeah, I want to come to that yes. in a minute. Um, uh, I wonder whether we could jump from, oh, actually, you met your wife at St. Thomas's King's That's Grove. right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, um, uh, you, you know, after what Ken Churchward did for me, out of gratitude. You want said, to go to church with him. <laughs> exactly. I want to go to church. So I went in there Sunday later, one Sunday later, Ken was preaching a wonderful, he was a, he was a great Bible expositor, and I just loved listening to him. And after church, uh, his wife was introducing me to uh, several people in the church in the foyer there and said, Michael is coming and he'll be going to more college. And, and one sweet lady came up to me and she said, and I remember I was 20, I wasn't quite 20, almost mm. 20 years old. <laughs> and she said, um, uh, do you have anywhere to go for lunch? I said, uh, well, no, not really. She said, would you like to come? Now, I'm normally very introvert and I always say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. But I said, yes, thank you. I'd love to come for lunch. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, I saw panic on her face and she left. <laughs> <laughs> she, she left it. And Mrs. Churchwood came back with a beautiful young woman and um, said to me, he said, this is Elizabeth Bailey. Her mother is that kind lady who invited you to lunch. 
mm -hmm. and she's going to walk you to the house, walk with you to the right. house, because I assumed she ran to prepare something. Right, okay. <laughs> 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 and so that was it. I, uh, it was for me love at first sight, and uh, our relationship blossomed. And we celebrated our fiftieth anniversary last year. Wow! Yeah, you were ordained here and were yes. assistant minister there yes. as well. Yes, absolutely. Thomas, is that right? Yeah. No, I uh, did catechist uh, at Dulwich Hill and Irwood, and then when I was ordained by Sir Michael Sloan. Um, I was in St. Philip's Karimba. Gotcha. Right. I worked with Tony Lamb for right. a couple of years and then just got really kind of had other plans and, and uh, we moved to California mm. in 77. Now take me to Atlanta and you're just planning a church, yep. uh, it's, so it's an Episcopal church yes. in Atlanta. and. Um, uh, we had a guest here a couple of ooh, a couple of months ago, Tony McClellan, mm -hmm. and uh, he was telling me the story of yeah. joining up with your church right. as a non-Christian, right. and he, his wife left him, yes. and he was in tears with the, in a conversation with you, right. and you said your problem is you need to know Jesus. Exactly. Tell yes. us about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, what happened, I've been living in Atlanta as the head of a mission organization headquartered mm -hmm. in Atlanta. So I've been in Atlanta for nine years. Mm -hmm. And I got to know the uh, business leadership in the city. Somehow mm -hmm. I developed all these relationships from, from just being there. And uh, so I really got to be part and parcel of the Southern culture and I loved it and uh, I still do. And um, so after traveling the globe with this ministry, I was all over the world the three or four times a year and preaching and speaking and, and uh, that got old and, mm. and I've been missing my four children mm. who were growing in the formative years and and I began to pray and the Lord clearly says I called you to preach not to be an administrator and occasionally speak. Uh, so I said Lord where would I go from here? I thought I might have to go to New York, San Francisco, big city something and the Lord said no 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 I want you to, he to plant, to, to bloom what I've planted you. And I have absolutely no idea how to plant a church. I've never read a book about planting a church. I knew nothing about it. I was teaching an adult Bible class in a, at the cathedral there, and um, I used to have 200 people in my class. Mm -hmm. And so when finally the burden was so heavy I couldn't take it, I just left and started. I have called a few friends and I said, we're going to start a church. And we were in a hotel room, very small uh, function room and uh, 28 adults mm -hmm. and uh, 16 children were in that room and we had a service, our first service. Yeah. And just as the word got out in the city and we began to just literally explode and we doubled the second Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> we had to move wow. to a private school, which I already been talking to them about that, a very, very prominent private school. And uh, we were there for six years in right. that school. Right. And we went from one service, two services, and we went to a third service, and then finally, God again provisionally provided this great building, very <laughs> the most visible location in the entire southeast. Mm. And uh, it was an amazing provision of God. Then we came up in the front, we built this lovely sanctuary. And uh, often they say it was the rest of history, but really there are a lot of pain in between. Yeah. I want to explore some of that About, pain yeah. with you. Um, uh, in 1991, yeah. what happened there? Well, from the moment I started, um, the diocese basically, well, I said to them, I said, look, you can just say no. I want to start an evangelical church within the diocese. Mm -hmm. And the bishop said, we got rid of the evangelicals a long time ago. We're going to start, have another one. Mm -hmm. I said, just say no. All I want to hear so I can move on. Uh, I was. I mean, you were an Anglican minister. I was ordained here in Sydney, yeah. and as a matter of fact, the previous bishop was one of those classic liberals who said, "I want you to come become canonically resident in Atlanta." I said, "Why?" He said, "Because I believe in tokenism, and I want to have a token evangelical." Mm -hmm. <laughs> Since then, he retired, and the new guy, even though we became good friends, and he would joke about this, and he said, "He still believe that Bible stuff?" I said, "Yes," and so he said, well, "Okay." go ahead and start the church, but please don't leave your day job because you're going to fail. 
He said, it will not, it will not go for six months. I said, uh, fine. Wow. Okay, I'll, I'll, I will not leave my day job. But anyway, so we started in this private school, and uh, as I was saying just a few minutes, we, we start growing, we start growing, and people coming, families, and many people being converted because mm -hmm. they come out of curiosity to visit this Episcopal church and hear the That's gospel. That's growing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they hear the gospel for the first time, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember an 83 year old, very prominent businessman. And uh, when I, uh, when I was preaching, you must be born again, and, and I would give an invitation, and uh, he gives his life to Christ. Later on, we developed a friendship, and he would say to me, he said, why did I have to wait to 83 to experience the joy mm. of knowing Jesus? And I've been going to church all my life. So that is a repeated story. Mm. So many of those people are prominent people in the city, but when the Lord took hold of them, the Holy Spirit brought them to to the Father, it's just become a, a, an amazing, amazing story in the city. And that made the, the new bishop who just came in angry. Really? <laughs> oh, angry. I can't believe you're preaching this stuff. We don't believe that stuff anymore. And sometimes you hear me on radio, because I started on a few radio stations, and, uh, and you call me. He said, I can't believe you said that. How can you even say that? It can be sure of heaven. Mm. How arrogant of you to say that. How can you say Jesus is the only way to salvation and eternal life? How can you? And he would just go. At, and it became four years of constant, constant hammering. Mm -hmm. I remember one time praying. I said, Lord, if you want me to spend the rest of my life doing this, if that's your will for me, that's fine. But I just want to know. Mm. And that's when I f we felt collectively as a vestry, uh, the leadership of the church, the lay leadership, that it's time for us to shake the dust mm. and move on. Yeah. Same-sex issues were part oh, of... ordaining practicing homosexuals. Right. Now, the problem was there were so many already ordained, and the bishops knew it when they did it, but they kept it quiet because it was against the canon at mm -hmm. that time. And so I remember that's taking, in the 80s. Taking a blind eye. The dom denomination was taking a turning a blind oh, eye yeah. to, to, if you like, Biblical morality. Yeah. Yeah. And We've got the same problem. by the same token, a man that you know and I know was my first uh, youth pastor. He's now oh, Archbishop tell us about Foley this. Yeah. Beach. <laughs> well, Foley and I were good friends, and, and so I brought him in to be our a youth pastor. And, and uh, then actually we supported him to go to seminary. And uh, he is now the Archbishop of the Anglican Church in, in America. He's a great guy. He really is a wonderful man. And, um, and uh, they nearly did not ordain him. Now, they ordained some people whom they knew uh, in the homosexual relationships, but they wouldn't, because he said, oh, he hears voices. Because he said, the Lord is calling me. Mm. And I believe the Lord is calling me to the ministry. And uh, they have problems. They nearly did not ordain him because they said, he hears voices. Wow. <laughs> they just thought psychologically that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and, and, and what, a, what, what a tragedy it was at the time. So we, we really prayed hard because we had some people who have deep roots in the Episcopal Church in America, and we you know, wanted to be sure that when we make a decision, it's God's uh, decision, not ours. And Tony McClellan was telling me it was a, it was a difficult decision, but a clear Extremely right difficult, decision. yes. Well, what I did, um, we did two things. We went to the convention and asked for a resolution to be passed. I wrote every word of it, that this convention believes, Episcopal Convention, that the Bible, both Old and New Testament, is the inspired and fallible Word of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, there were 350 delegates mm -hmm. uh, at, that, at that particular convention, and uh, it got five, five votes. Wow. And that's mostly our delegates and, and one other person. And so our leadership basically said, look, we're in the wrong place. We need to move on and we need to shake the dust. And uh, so th that was our first, uh, our first feeling that the time is gone. The other thing we did is that I asked them to fast and pray for 36 hours. And uh, so we went and fasted and prayed. For th then we met for breakfast on a Saturday morning in a, uh, a venue that we were using for our offices. And uh, I began saying, well, anybody has anything to say? 
And the first person said, well, every time I pray, I sense in my spirit that God already told you what to do. And the other guy said, that's exactly how I, I came to conclusion, that God already spoke to you. God already told you what to do. I said, okay, I didn't want to do this, but yes, he, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm led to, to move on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was a unanimous vote, and then we went to the congregation. As Actually, we had one vote against. The whole congregation really? voted for oh. it, and uh, and we're so grateful we did this because since that time, of course, God brought so many other people. Churches grew and grew and grew. In fact, we lost 25 members over the decision, but that same year we added 250 members. Yeah, as if God said, "I'm going to give you tenfold." Yeah, for your obedience mm. and. Uh, and they say the rest is history. The church, of course, became a platform from which we are reaching 195 countries for Christ. Yeah. Uh, 13,000 times a week yeah. in 28 languages. Now let's just, I mean, there's a, there's a prophetic application for the Australian church yes. uh, from that story yes. that we have at the moment mm -hmm. uh, in the Anglican denomination right. in Australia. We have the, uh, the Archbishop of Perth who has just um, ordained mm. to, as a deacon um, a man who um, well, wasn't married three months ago oh. and yet had children, mm. um, and another man in a civil partnership uh, mm. with another man. And, uh, and that is so far away from, well, the biblical gospel. Sure. And where the Diocese of yeah. Sydney. Sydney, and where I have my roots, yes. Yeah. 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 And so, I mean, there's going to be some very complex mm. discussions mm. over the next couple of months. Right. And, um, uh, I mean, what's your word? I mean, you, you just say God blessed you tenfold when you actually chose to be faithful to him. He did. And I tell you, the same thing happened with Foley Beach because he was in the Episcopal Church and he would come and see me and we'll talk and we'll pray about it. And I find I said the third time, I said, Foley, I know there's a concern on your part and all of this. I said, but remember this. I honor those who honor me, says the Lord. For well, those who honor me, I shall I honor, says the Lord, to First Samuel. And I said, you need to honor the Lord. And, and he has never forgotten that. And sure enough, he went out and made the decision. And look, now God is using him as in, a, mm -hmm. in, a, in a magnificent way. So it's not just me. It's everyone that I know who honored God and, you know, and, and, and took a stand, like Martin Luther saying, here I stand, for I can do no other. Mm. God blesses that. Yeah. And I know this diocese. I love this diocese, diocese of Sydney. And I just know uh, that God will bless Sydney, continue to bless Sydney even more than he has already blessed Sydney when they take a stand. Mm. And uh, regardless, uh, and I know I'm saying things that those who are really heart is institutional heart is so tied to, to the name, but uh, you know, you, you got GAFCON, you, mm. got, you got this amazing group of Anglicans around the world. Yeah. You got this group of uh, Anglicans throughout the United States. So, yeah, it is fantastic yeah. what is happening under the Anglican Church of North America yeah. and under Foley's leadership. Yeah. And the way, I suppose I'd say, so many of my friends there mm. have been so spectacularly blessed since taking a courageous stand for Jesus. No question, because that's his promises. God yeah. is true to his promises. And in this book, I mentioned the story of the Archbishop of York. Yeah, well, actually, let's talk about yeah. that. Um, so you've written this book, Never Give Up, um, which, which really is a journey, your journey through to Timothy. Yes. Um, now, um, I'm, we'll come to... Well, sure. yeah, um, let's, I just want to drop on you yes. a couple of verses yes. from this book right. and, uh, and then just get you to hit them for a six, if you right. like. Um, <laughs> uh, God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Right. Yeah. Tell me about that. I'm absolutely convinced in my own heart. And again, this is not thus says the Lord, but as I read and I got deeper into my understanding of what Paul is saying, is that obviously he knew Timothy well. Mm. He, he knew his strength, he knew his weaknesses. And, and, and you know, the scripture doesn't just use frivolous words. Mm. And I, now as the Holy Spirit led Paul to write those words, he knew what the temptations that Timothy is facing, timidity, fear, apprehension. And so he writes clearly says, mm. this is not from God. Mm. This is a spirit, but it's not from the Holy Spirit, mm. it's from the evil spirit. And therefore don't allow that spirit to dominate your life. 
stand for Christ, stand for the truth, and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. A kind of a vernacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he, God did not give us, and sometimes we say, oh, we just need to be polite, or we need to do this and that. This is just a, a going around it. Now, I am a polite person, I like to think, mm -hmm. and I, even with the people with whom I disagreed and eventually parted, I've never, uh, you know, used any derogatory words. Uh, I just talked about the truth, and if they departed from the truth, I will not, because as I often say to my congregation until they're tired of it, that I live for one thing, that's the audience of one. Mm. And the audience of one, I'm not the only one gonna have it, we're all gonna have it. And so in my heart of heart, do I want to say, look, um, I brought, you know, how many people I brought, how many sermons I preached, mm. how many books I've written, or I want to say, because when, when Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. He did not say much done. Mm. So we often, even in, especially in America, <laughs> we always think, you know, it's not mu much done. He said, well done. Mm. And that's what all I want to do. And I pray that all my brothers and sisters in Christ here in, in this place that I love so dearly would, would do the same. I said, you know, we're going to stand. We're not going to compromise. And if somebody wants to depart from the truth, let them depart. We're going to stand. Yeah. And it's on, on that note and false teaching spreading like yep. gangrene yep. and that kind of thing. Exactly. That, that you raise in this book the issue of, well, he's now 2IC in the Church of England, Stephen Cottrell. Do yep. you want to talk That's about right. that? That's yeah. right. The, the Archbishop of York. And when he was ordained, I mean, literally, before he was ordained, everybody kind of see the writing on the wall because he, his views were... But then he takes even a stronger stand and saying, if you don't agree with my view, he calls the Church of England immoral because of believing in biblical marriage. He says the church is immoral. Mm. And therefore, uh, if you, any of the clergy uh, who do not support the ordination of homosexuals uh, and the marriage of homosexuals in the churches, they need to leave. I mean, mm -hmm. I quote him word for mm -hmm. word. I don't take you him do. out of context. I am very careful about these things. I have a good research assistant yeah. <laughs> who helps me because I'm, I tend to be kind of entrepreneurial and you know mm -hmm. uh, creative. But uh, but no, I go I mean, back and yeah, I, I, I plug the, on page six and seven. You've got the exact yeah. quote. I, and I, I plug those quotes and make sure that I, I'm I'm uh, and I thank God for for those. Um, who work with me and around me because they help me <laughs> keep, so, my, keep my tie from falling in the soup. <laughs> so you're arguing, join with me in suffering for yeah, the gospel. Absolutely. Paul's arguing, yep. join with me in yeah. suffering for the gospel. What's yeah. that going to look like in terms of tough decisions for people? Well, I think in the West, it's going to be more of, uh, as you know, I'm from the Middle East, and I travel the Middle East several times a year. I have, we have extensive ministries in the Arab and Muslim world. And the suffering there is different from mm -hmm. what's going to be here. Here's going to be emotional, mental, and of course spiritual, and isolation, uh, name calling. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that I have been called names mm -hmm. I never heard before, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, I wear them as a badge of honor. And when Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness, uh, that, that, that's not a frivolous statement. Mm. And so we need to take that blessing, uh, the makarios, that, that, that uh, joy of really being found privileged to suffer for Christ and stop worrying about our little comfort and being called mm. uh, all kinds of nice things by the fallen world. We just have to accept that as part of the discipleship cost. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Yep. Yeah. And I really, I, I, I'm just, whatever years I've got left, I want to uh, plead, plod, uh, do whatever it takes to, for, for the remnant, the faithful remnant to stand strong and not to compromise out of fear, out of isolation, out of alienation, because those are the difficult things that are going to be faced in the Western world. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, God may, in his sovereign will, use that to bring about an awakening, which he's done in history mm -hmm. before, when things really got bad, whether before the Wesley brothers or uh, in, after the American Revolution, we know awakenings came. 
or he may return. Either mm. way is fine by me. <laughs> I'm ready. One last verse. <laughs> Preach the word in season, yeah. out of season, yeah. for the time will come when people won't put up with sound doctrine. Yeah. yeah. And he's talked about the last days. Yeah. We? <laughs> if we are in the last days, and I'm not a dispensationalist, but I thank God for those who are. But, you know, if we are in the last days, um, certainly that's applicable to us. Mm. That we're seeing now, um, and I can tell you stories, I don't want to mm -hmm. waste your time, but story after story of people say to me, you know, your preaching is just too hard. I'm going to find me a, a preacher who's softer and gentler mm. and kinder. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sorry for you, but by all means, uh, go ahead. And, um, and there's nothing I can do about it. But me, mean, meanwhile, I become even stronger, mm. not accommodate uh, you know, those individuals. So that itching ear, which is a pathological mm. condition, is that they basically want to hear what's going to make them good. I was, I was on CNN. I mean, it's not a secret. It's published mm. and <clears throat> this uh, anchor <laughs> during commercial break. I said, why do you visit our church? He said, no. I said, why? He said, because you're going to tell me I'm going to hell. I go to a church that says no hell. There is no hell. I said, I didn't even know you know who I am. He said, you're kidding? He said, everybody knows who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and we kind of, you know, laughed about it, but in reality it broke my heart, you know, why, I mean, this is common now. Mm. I go to a church that says there is no hell, no heaven, that whatever you make in this life is, is it, and that's what the preachers are saying, and therefore they're taking, mm. taking all these people down the road to hell with them. Mm. And that's why I said the problem in America, and I cannot speak for any other country because that's the place I know, the problems in America all started in the pulpits. Mm. They did not start and losing confidence in the word of absolutely. God. Absolutely. They did yeah. not start in the Democratic Party, Republican Party. It's not in politics. Started in the pulpits is when the, the when the when the authority of the scripture ceased, with it came the confusion mm -hmm. that we're facing now. Thanks so much for coming in. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Dr. Michael Yusuf. The book is Never Give Up. And uh, thanks for joining us on The Pastor. Dr. Yusuf, of course, he's the uh, senior pastor of uh, Church of the Apostles in Atlanta, Georgia. And, of course, the uh, founder and leader of the Leading the Way ministry. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart. And we will look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon.